About halfway through Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, Rio Morales tells her son that no matter where he goes, he has to promise to protect himself, to remember who cares for him, to remember who loves him. She makes him promise to remember who he is because everyone won't root for him like his own will. Across the Spider-Verse builds on what the previous film had established. Into the Spider-Verse had Miles' father aid him in creating a sturdy base, a foundation, the core of who he is. Jefferson, amidst all the chaos, makes sure that his son knows that he is a bright, bright kid. A kid so radiant that it's hard to see what's ahead sometimes. His presence is sometimes so blinding. He tells Miles that he has a spark and it's amazing, and that he'll be great at whatever he chooses to do with. His father established a foundation of love in the first film, and his mother ensures that he never forgets that he is deserving of that love in the second, instructing him to never stand for any treatment that doesn't accept who he is. The spark that Jefferson Morales speaks about is infectious. It has impacted everyone around him. Peter B. Parker was a man who was alone, struggling and hesitant about his future. Lost, in a sense. Miles' very existence as his mentee was such a gratifying experience for him that he decided to take control of his life and even choose to have children when he didn't want to, just for the chance that that child could be as kind and as cool as Miles Morales. That spark Miles carries infects those that he barely knows. Miles knew Hobie for about half a mission in the film, but quickly Hobie was pulled in by Miles' radiance, understanding that Miles stands for everything he does, that being Spider-Man means being for the people, no matter what, and Hobie is impacted by this kid to the point where he even helps Miles escape the spider society and joins his cause. It's that same spark that has him save Pav's Inspector Singh and the child, saved him from the potential heartbreak. Miles' spark has Gwen absolutely smitten. Gwen as we know her is guarded. She's lost her only friend ever, and that made her afraid to form any connections. In this film, she's coming off her and her father's falling out. She doesn't have a home to go back to anymore. Gwen's own father is afraid of her. She is now afraid of going home, and she still has these feelings about Miles. On top of that, over the past few months, as she's joined the Spider Society, she's visited all of these worlds, these universes, and she's dead in a lot of them. She's fallen for Spider-Man in so many timelines, and so that makes her even more guarded, even more afraid of confronting the feelings that she has. But Miles, that ray of sunshine, he's always willing to be different, to try and be different, to take that leap of faith. And he tells her on that building that there is a first time for everything. And she is constantly in awe of his willingness to try. Gwen is head over heels for Miles, fully in love. She risked a universe-threatening mission just to see Miles again. In her own world, she thinks about him constantly. As the memory of his face paints the train windows, she adores him. You're amazing, she says, like he always is. Miles represents the very small, tiny chance that the impossible is possible. His very existence and his passion are proof of that. His act of defiance against the society sparked her desire to try one more time to reach her dad. And yet, having reached all these people, Gwen, Peter, Hobie, all of the spider people from the first film, Miles still finds himself alone at the end of this film. Miles only knew Spider-Man to be a collaborative effort. He's never had to be alone and figure it out all by himself. In the first half of this film, he lives the authentic Spider-Man experience to a degree. There's this inherent loneliness when it comes to the idea of Spider-Man in general, right? All Spider-People introduce themselves as the one and only Spider-Man. This idea that on the most grounded level, Spider-Man is the sole hero of New York and he has to ultimately juggle this incredible responsibility, juggle the few friends that they have, their personal life, and most of the time they don't tell anybody about it, out of fear of getting others involved, hurt, and or in Miles' case, fear of the repercussions. So when Miles has to experience this and balance this all by himself in the sequel, it's a bit harder for the young Spider-Man, having lived the other side of it. 
So when Gwen gets the chance to visit Miles, she tells him about everything that's going on in her life. He already knew the loneliness that she had experienced, the friends that she didn't have and couldn't make, the unique bond they shared. Gwen was the one person who knew, down to the smallest details, of that specific brand of isolation that Miles felt. And in comes Gwen, raving on about the adventures that she's had, the friends she's made, the community she's felt. In Mumbatton, he sees the camaraderie that he's missed out on. She's been traveling to all these different dimensions for months, and not once did she come to see him. It hurts. He's then brought to the Spider Society, and is greeted with everything he ever dreamed of. Miles wanted to go to school to study interdimensional travel, to be able to visit his friends. This was it. Miles expected to feel the love of a community that was just like him, the exact opposite of the loneliness he felt back home. And instead, it was met with hostility, an immense disappointment. He joined the Spider Society to befriend hundreds of people with stories like his, to see people who look just like him, and to bond with those who have felt the exact same emotions that he has, and instead left feeling more alone than ever before. I got the chance to watch the movie a few times now, and still, that scene when Miles' voice is shaking and you can just hear the sadness in his voice on the brink of tears talking about how badly he wanted to just see his friends is still as moving as it was the first time. And then that realization settles in, the heartbreak settles in, that even Gwen and Peter, his two best friends, want to stop him and that they knew all along. Gwen says that it's for his own good, that his father dies. Miles literally gets beaten by this idea that he is different. Miguel tells him that he was a mistake, the original anomaly, that it's his fault for creating this interdimensional supervillain, that Miles needs to suffer to become Spider-Man. And Miles is then expected to conform and follow what Miguel tells him to do, just like everyone in the Spider Society has. Because they have all been forged by death and suffering and sacrifice, as Miguel calls it, they've been forged by their shared trauma, their canon events. So Miguel and all the other spider people, including Gwen and Peter B, believe that Spider-Man is Spider-Man because of those events. This movie then begs the question, what exactly does it mean to be Spider-Man? What does this character represent? Is it the strict canon events that makes the character? Is Spider-Man then defined by this shared destiny and fate, by tragedy? Are you really Spider-Man if these things don't happen to you? If you don't look a certain way, can anyone really wear the mask? Throughout the entire movie, Miles has been told that he has to follow the path that has been set out for him. He has to follow fate or destiny. Everyone is actively telling him what he can and can't do. Telling him who he is. He is not Spider-Man. He's an anomaly. The guidance counselor tells him that he can't have his cake and eat it too. Spider Pig once told him that you can't save everyone. Miguel tells him that he can't save the world and his dad. But still, Miles doesn't fold. Not even when hundreds of spider people are hunting him down. Miles, at the end of this film, says and believes that he is strong because of his parents. He fights and fights in this film because he just knows at his core that Spider-Man doesn't just let things happen. Spider-Man doesn't let people die. Even against all odds, his foundation will never falter because that is who he is and it's how he was raised. Aaron told him to keep going. Miles is an Afro-Latino kid that wants to go to Princeton, a predominantly white institution. He is the one Spider-Man that was never supposed to get bit. The original anomaly. Being different is baked into his DNA, and as his mother says, people will root against him because of that. He won't always be accepted and loved the way he should be, but to him that just doesn't matter. He will do things his own way. Miles has been Spider-Man for a year. His whole life though, he has watched Spider-Man, and the one thing Spider-Man always did was try. Miles fully believes that there is a way to save both his father and his world. He fully believes Spider-Man can do both. He always does both, and even if he fails, at least he tried. At least he tried to defy fate, destiny, canon. He tried to have two kicks.
He never chose to get bit. He never wanted to. He was never supposed to. Again, the original anomaly. Yet, here Miles Morales stands atop everyone as Spider-Man. As the only one who understands what Spider-Man is supposed to be. Miles being a quote-unquote anomaly is proof that anyone can wear the mask. Anyone who understands the responsibility of it. Miles believes that Spider-Man is not defined by his failures or losses. He's not defined by guilt or grief or trauma, as Miguel O'Hara has become. Miguel has become paralyzed by his fear, to the point of inaction. And that isn't Spider-Man. That's not Miles Morales. It never has been. Miles, through these films, has been defined by his willingness to take that leap of faith. Miguel and Peter tell Miles that being Spider-Man is sacrifice. But Miles disagrees. Spider-Man is not sacrifice. He's not in action. He's never going to just stand by and watch. Spider-Man is hope. And Miles has the opportunity to offer himself that hope. But being different has a price. And by the end of this film, that price is his loneliness. Stranded in a dimension where no one can help him. His only friends have deserted him. The spider society is turned against him. His parents can't save him, and this universe's Miles Morales is the Prowler. All because that spider bit him instead. There is this inherent loneliness to being Spider-Man, and all Miles ever wanted to do is to go against that idea that Spider-Man needs to be alone. But it feels like fate is forcing him to be. Both physically and ideologically, Spider-Man, like he's always been, is alone. To trust yourself, your teachings, your gut, despite everyone telling you you're wrong, despite your best friend and your mentor telling you otherwise, is a lonely road. But it is a leap of faith. 